Welcome to a new episode of Insight Interviews of the Shia Research Institute. And I am Sajad Rizvi, Professor of Islamic Intellectual History at the University of Exeter in England. Uh, today we're going to be in conversation with uh, Professor Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmed, uh, who is the Prophet Muhammad University Professor of um, Shia uh, Studies at uh, Florida International University. And we'll be talking about his research and uh, future um, plans that he has for publications. So uh, welcome, uh, Nizam Thank you. Din. Thank you. And um, pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. Um, I guess the obvious place to start mm -hmm. is if you could just tell me a bit about your research journey mm -hmm. and how it is that you came to work on Ibn Arabi in particular, and then we'll kind of take things beyond that. That's um, a very uh, interesting story, if I may be so bold to say that. Um, it also intersects with my own personal spiritual journey as well. Um, I was always fascinated uh, by the spiritual path, Irfan, Tasawwuf, uh, growing up. My late father, Rahimahullah, was involved in Sufism. Although I didn't really learn that until I was, uh, you know, fully, I think I was in my 20s when I found that out. It was very low profile about it. And when I was actually at university as an undergrad, and my undergraduate was actually in mathematics, I became very interested in philosophy. Mm. And um, I started reading some Western philosophers. And I didn't really find them to be too interesting, honestly. <laughs> I suppose the reason was I started with Nietzsche. Uh, right, that's probably not the way Well, I, I quite enjoyed his The Antichrist, um, which, of course, is a polemic against uh, Christianity. Um, a very readable book, but I was more interested in metaphysical questions. And so I wanted to read people like Avicenna, but there really wasn't a lot available, mm -hmm. <clears throat> except for at that time was uh, Parviz Marawij's uh, Metaphysica and things like this. And to make a long story short, I'd always heard about uh, a Shaykh al Akbar wal Kibrit al Ahmar, you know, the greatest, the Dr. Maximus, the greatest Shaykh, and the red sulfur, this alchemical mm -hmm. term. And I came across a translation of his Bezels of Wisdom for Sus al-Hikam in the uh, Classics Western Spirituality series published by Paulist Press, a Catholic publication house. And that was the Austin translation. Hmm. And uh, I was still an undergraduate at the time. I was sort of in the middle of my undergraduate career at Purdue University. And I started reading that in translation. But I had, um, while growing up, I had spent a number of years in Saudi Arabia because my father was a professor of sociology there at King Abdulaziz University. And so I had an understanding of Arabic. And when I was reading that, I was like, what is the original Arabic here? When he says, you know, the absolute, does he say Allah? Does he say Al-Haq? Does he say, you know? Yeah. So this was back in the day. So I got a copy of the Fusus al hikam in Arabic through interlibrary loan. This is before internet and all that. I mean, the internet existed, but not like now. Yeah. And that was the Afifi edition. <clears throat> and I started reading that and sort of deepening my understanding of Arabic beyond a merely, merely sort of rudimentary level. And that's how I really got interested in Ibn Arabi. And so eventually, you know, I got my degrees, uh, finished my math degree, went on to study Arabic at Indiana University and became, you know, I was really in quest of the works of Ibn Arabi. Right. I really wanted to read the Futuhat and things. And there were a lot of different currents in the Muslim world at the time and, and Islam in America. And, you know, you, you would hear about different people who were, who would sort of, name drop Ibn Arabi, but they really didn't know what he was about. And uh, so that's what really drew me to Ibn Arabi. Yeah. I would really say that was the reason I, I learned Arabic. Right. Uh, I mean, there were other reasons, but he was a major, um, a major, uh, you know, factor. Well, that's, that's a serious motivation because yeah. it's difficult reading Ibn Arabi in Arabic. It's very difficult reading Ibn Arabi, but you know, I, I received a lot of encouragement because after my stint at Purdue and I got my bachelor's, I went to Indiana University and started doing my Arabic. And at the time, uh, the the person who really helped me there a lot uh, was Victor Danner when it came to Ibn Arabi. I didn't take Arabic classes with him. I took Arabic classes with Suzanne Stedkevich. Yeah. But uh, Victor Danner was very interested in Ibn Arabi. You know, he'd spent time in Morocco. His Arabic was fantastic. And he really, he knew a lot about the Fusus, the Futuhat, and many other things. And so that sort of got me started. And so many years later, you know, when I was uh, doing um, further Arabic studies in Cairo, I found out that 
there was supposed to be an autographed manuscript of the Fusus and Hikam yeah. in Turkey, in Konya. And the Afifi edition is not based on that. It's based on some very much later, not very good manuscripts in my right. view. And so I always wondered about this. And the person who made that statement was actually Uthman Yahya, hmm. who is a Syrian scholar who basically he became Shi'i. Hmm. But he was Ismaili. I can. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, yeah, from a Syrian Ismaili background. So he was actually living in Cairo uh, at the Dominican Institute, and then I ended up taking a class with, uh, arranging a private class with him. Hmm. And he says that this manuscript is there in Konya. Um, so fast forward many years later, I'm teaching at American University in Cairo, and I go to Cairo in the summer of 2009 to look for this manuscript. And I go to Konya and I ask people and, you know, we went, we went to different places and I assumed it would be in the library of Jalal al-Din Rumi, which is, you know, it's actually called mm. a museum, Mevlana yeah. Muzesi. Yeah. And so I went there and oddly enough, the catalog there was by a Shi'i scholar, um, mm. Abdul Baki Gul Penadle. Yeah. And so I went through the whole catalog there and I didn't find any mention of it. And I asked people, nobody knew anything about this. So then I had a Turkish friend who knew this elderly chap who was involved in manuscript research, and we went to see him at his house. And after we had some excellent ice cream, Dundurmas, <laughs> he said, no, no, it's actually in, in Istanbul. I said, really? He says, yeah, it's in the um, um, Turk the Islam Esrladi Muzesi, and I was living yeah. around the corner. So ultimately, we get a hold of the manuscript, and it's actually not the autograph of Ibn Arabi, what it actually is. And this is the critical edition that ultimately resulted from that. Yeah. What do you produce here? The one which I worked on. Um, it's actually in the handwriting of his disciple, Sadr al-Din mm. who dies around the same time as Nasir al-Din and we need to talk about Tulsi. Yes, 672. We'll yeah. Hijra 1274, I think. 1274. So it's in his handwriting, but on the first folio, there is a... Um, in, in the handwriting of Ibn Arabi, he he's basically says that Sadruddin has read this book back to me and I give him an ijazah for it. Yeah. And I think someone later sort of circles it and puts it like in a, in a balloon, so to speak. And that is definitely in the handwriting of Ibn Arabi. Okay. So that's the whole story behind it. And I wanted to just produce an edition that was based on, on that. Right. And that also had... Originally, it was my aim to, you know, to put the different commentaries in the margins. But in the end, what I did, ended up doing was going with the commentary by Qaisari, which is much later. Yeah. But it's probably the most voluminous and the most widely read, especially in the Shi'i world. Yeah. Kashani seems to be more in circulation among the Sunnis. Mm. Or at least in the Sunni, oddly enough, Kashani was Shi'i. Yeah. Qaisari was Sunni. Anyhow, so I, I ended up putting in something like um, six or seven hundred uh, footnotes glosses on the text in which I put in the full tashkil. In Urdu right. we would say Arab pure Arab but yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, we so put in the full tashkil. And sometimes you have to make decisions. And so I'd always look at Qaisri. In one or two instances I looked at Kashani. Um but that was the uh, whole motivation and it was a very, very inspiring um thing. Right. Because you really don't it, it's it's very different when you read a book out loud. So I had someone who was helping me mm. um Ustaz Ahmed Sultan, uh, who is a Hassanid Sharif, uh, who was actually my calligraphy teacher in Cairo, and we worked together. And sometimes I would read back, and he would read back, and we would check. And it's very different when you read a text out loud. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think the habits of reading have also changed in the modern world. I think in in the medieval times, people would read, you know, quietly. There was a kind of sub vocalizing that would take place. And you see this, like when people read like the Quran and they rock back and forth. And so we don't really do that. We have, I think silent reading is a, is a, is a new phenomenon. And when you read it out loud. It, oh, no it, reading at all. Or no reading. <laughs> no, but there's a book called The History of Reading by um, uh, the Spanish guy. Or this guy who writes yeah. in Spanish. What Manguel. Is Manguel. Yeah. So if, that's a fascinating book. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's a very good book. So it's a whole different experience. And Ibn Arabi came alive for me in a completely different way um, as a result of that experience. So. Well, I guess we should really say something a bit more about what the Fusus is. Yes. And uh, and this reception then. So if you could say a bit more about what the text is and what its significance is, how it's received. Well, the Fusus al-Hikam is an extremely concentrated uh, work of uh, Muhyiddin al-Arabi. And because it's so short, people think it's accessible because they would rather read something that's 
you know, about a hundred odd pages hmm. without any apparatus. That's about what it would be. And the yeah. manuscript is about 80 folios. As opposed to reading, you know, about 5,000 pages of the Al-Futuhat al makiyah yes. Now, oddly enough, some passages in the Al-Futuhat al makiyah are very readable. But most of the Fusus is, I would not say, an easy read. I, I don't totally think there's true. a single sentence to... I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that is that is um, crystal clear. I remember doing the, the introduction of the Fusus with students and making them cry. Yeah. Because they couldn't make sense of anything. There are passages of an exceedingly, an almost runic obscurity, uh, almost a kind of, you know, um, oracular sayings in some regards as well. So it's a very difficult text. Ibn Arabi was a master of the Arabic language. And, you know, it's actually in 27 chapters. But if you include the opening, the exoridium or the khutbah, the, the opening yeah. discourse, it's then it would be 28. And, and yeah. 28 is very important. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to get into all this, but there is a symbolism that goes with the letters of the Arabic alphabet because there's 28 letters in the Arabic yeah. alphabet. And the letters are very important for Ibn al-Arabi. Um, but let's put that on the side for the moment. So each of the 27 chapters is associated with a particular prophet. Yeah. So Fusus al-Hikam means the bezels of wisdom. And so the bezel... I don't have one on this watch, but like some watches, they have a bezel which which moves or rotates, or like on a ring, like a ring like this. Um, that can also be the fuss. Hmm. Um, so this ring doesn't have anything; it's flat, it's silver, but it has some writing on it. Some rings in these, in you know, the lower rings in the Islamic world, they they'll have a a gemstone, and there yeah. may be even be writing on the gemstone, yeah, like, that. like yours, yeah. So this concept of the fuss or the gemstone, or the ringstone, or the the bezel, mm. is a symbol, if you look into the various commentaries, of the heart of a particular prophet. Right. And so each of these more or less Quranic prophets mm. symbolizes a particular wisdom which goes with a certain divine name or names. Yeah. And it's interesting because Qaisri will tell you what the divine names are. Right. There's associated. Um and they say more or less Quranic prophets because all of them are mentioned in the Quran except for chapter 26, mm. which is the so-called extra-canonic prophet uh, Khalid ibn Sinan. And he is mentioned in both Sunni and Shi'i hadith tradition as being a prophet in the Fatra, in the period in between, uh, you know, the prophet before him and, and, and the yeah. coming of, of, the rest of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And actually, I talk about that in the appendices to yeah. the to my edition. So each of these prophets then symbolizes a particular wisdom, and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is distinguished as being the complete and total embodiment of all the divine names in actuality. Yeah. In act, not you know, bil fa'l. Yes. Not bil quwa. Whereas if you read the first chapter, which is the, the symbolism of Adam, the wisdom of the of divinity in, in the word of Adam, فَصْرُ حِكْمَةٍ إِلَهِيَةٍ فِي كَلِمَةٍ آدَمِيَّةٍ Yeah. That's Adam as primordial humanity. Yeah. And in that sense that each human being has in potentia, بِالْقُوَّةِ these divine names. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it depends on that individual to actualize those divine names in their life and so forth. But no one is, is has all of the the words, as the Prophet said, Utitu yeah. al Karim. So, in that sense, then the Fusus, I think, can be seen as a kind of extended commentary on the concept, an exceedingly important concept of Al Insan al Kamil or the perfect man. Yeah. Um, and. Of course, there's other ideas. So the other key idea associated with Muhyiddin al-Arabi, of course, is Wahdat al-Wujud. Yeah. Although they all say, most people say he never actually used this phrase. This phrase comes through the commentators, but he actually has phrases close to it in mm. the Futuhat. And all of those citations are in um, Professor Jahan Giri's work on Ibn al-Arabi. Right. Um, I forget the title in Persian. I actually have the Arabic translation. You, right. you might. Do you remember the Persian title? No, I didn't. So there's an Allah Jahangiri who has this important work on Ibn Arabi. The Muslim Jahangiri. I think so, yeah. yeah. So there's the doctrine of Wahdat al Wujud, the unicity of being. Yeah. And then there, of course, is the notion or the teaching of how the universe is the theophany of the divine names. Yeah. 
And then, of course, there's al-insan al-kamil, or the perfect man. And then there's also the doctrine of al-a'yan al-thabita, hmm. or um, it's very hard to translate the fixed entities. Or but but ain, you know, it means I, it means well, but it really means a source. Yeah. So it's it's more like the source forms, or if you like, the source ideas. It's very much, I think, the Akbari or Ibn Arabian version, if you hmm. like, of the platonic ideas or the platonic Platonic forms um and there's a lot more that could be said there but i think that is really what the fusus is uh is about but there is a lot of symbolism in this book Hmm. and the symbolism cannot be translated and you know the fusus is written for a very learned audience but i don't mean learned in the in the sense of of only, you know, just um, a didactic kind of knowledge. Yeah, but more experiential, more kind of, you've more actually done it. Yeah. Exactly, but 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 even more so, the, the actual sort of didactic learning hmm. that goes there is for the person who is thoroughly grounded in the Qur'an. Yeah. If you're not grounded in the Qur'an, you won't see it. I mean, even, and, and he has all sorts of um, iqtibasat, sort of like, little quotes from the Quran which he incorporates seamlessly into his speech but you won't yeah. know unless you've read the Quran so like yeah. in the opening khutbah he talks about bilqil al aqwam well that's a reference to surah muzammil right. um but you have to know yeah and the, he does the same with hadith because in in the manuscript in the in the time of the hand produced book there's no critical apparatus <clears throat> there's yeah. no editor <clears throat> You know, if he just he just says, "Kuntu nabiyan wa Adamu bain al ma'i wa tin," I was a prophet when when Adam was between water and coal. That's a hadith. Yeah. Well, you have to know that that's. And he's saying it mm-hmm. is, but he's not going to tell you where it is. Yeah, you're expected to know. And so it is for a sort of learned readership. And the truly astonishing thing is just how far this book has traveled in the Muslim world. I don't think there is this a, a single Muslim manuscript library. Of course, the really big ones. But even private libraries that does not have at least one copy in some from some period of the Fusus. And it was there were hundreds of commentaries in Arabic, in Persian, in Turkish, in mm. Chagatai, um, translations, versions in Urdu, yeah. um, paraphrased versions in classical Chinese. So this book was very widely read, but it wasn't very deeply read. I don't think it was read by a but low, by, by everyone in society, but it was very widely diff- diffused as a text. But then the ideas hmm. are diffused throughout, through literature. Yes, poetry in particular. Yeah. Poetry in particular. And I think some fascinating stuff happened because, because um, when Muhyiddin al-Arbi was in, in, in Anatolia and he took Sadr al-Din Qunui under his wing as his disciple, as his stepson as well, hmm. Sadruddin really becomes this great commentator, and he was thoroughly grounded in the traditional Islamic disciplines, including hadith. He's a great scholar of hadith, yeah. but also in the philosophy of Avicenna. And he also knew Jalaluddin Rumi. Yes. And he's the first commentator on the Fusus. And he meets, you know, Fakhruddin Iraqi comes there and attends these classes on the Fusus, and he writes the text in Persian, the Lama'at. Hmm. And that's a kind of further development of the notion of, of what is later they called Mazhab Ishq in Persian. Mm. But it's there in Ahmad al Ghazali. Yeah. Right. Early on, the sort of, you know, elaborate sort of love poetry, Ishq mm. poetry. And it's there in the Lama'at. And then it goes on, <clears throat> excuse me, from there and sort of erupts in people like Hafiz. Um, but it, but it's there also in a text like Gulshan i Raz. I mean, all of these ideas are there and that permeates through society. And especially in South Asia, is found in the Qawwali tradition, of course, yeah, and the other sort of popular uh, Sufi traditions, which survived throughout the Indian, uh, the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent today, and are particularly strong, I think, in in uh, Punjab, Multan, yeah. these areas. Yeah, that's um, the amongst the with the Sarawardis, you have the mm-hmm. the early reception of the Lamaat. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then of course with the Chishtis and even with the Naqshbandis, you have the formal commentaries on the Fusus. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I guess that gives us a sense of the the broader impact and reception. Um, what about the specific uh, Shi'i reception? That's really interesting because 
I was really surprised when I first went to study in Cairo. I I arrived in Cairo um, a few months shy of my 25th birthday, I think. Yeah, that's right. And uh, began my studies of Arabic thereafter after India University at mm-hmm. American University in Cairo, part of what was called the CASA program, yeah. Center for Arabic Study Abroad. <clears throat> and I was surprised that the only real shah you could find was a terrible edition of Al Kashani. <clears throat> And um, I remember buying a very bad copy of that from Maidan Lazar many years Maidan ago. Lazar, it was it Maidan Lazar or was it Maktab at Subay? It was like a, just like a almost like a stall in Maidan Lazar or something. So the Maidan Lazar they would sell there, then there was a Maktab at Subay, and then there was you know, there's all these little bookshops around. It looked around like there. it'd been stapled, yeah, it was very bad. bad. And there was an a, a earlier one which which goes all the way back to uh, the Bulak days, yeah, and I think Bulaq. that was published in 13 something of the Hijra 1311. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not. A, there's a lithograph. Yes, you're right. Hmm. You are quite right. There's a lithograph, and then later there is a um, movable type. Yeah, which would have been probably maybe 1910s or so. Yeah, I have both of those now. Yeah. But the edition of Kashani, which I was familiar with at Indiana University Bloomington, was the movable type version, which is what Izutsu cites throughout his book Sufism and Taoism. Yeah. But it seemed that in the Sunni world, you would only find Kashani. I knew there was a commentary by Ajandi, can't, can't get it. I knew there was a commentary by Qaisari, not available. All of them are published in Iran, available in Iran. <clears throat> and this I always found, thought to be very, very odd. Mm. You know, why is it, and you know, important figures have been fascinated by it. I mean, Alama Taba Tabai, important contemporary figure. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, the very famous name for other reasons mm. as well. Um, you know, Ayatollah Ruhullah Al Khomeini. Yeah, of course. Right? He was a commentator. He has glasses. Um, Jalaluddin Ashtiani, who's a close a disciple of uh, Khomeini as well. Uh, these guys are very interested in Arabi, and yeah. it really begs the question, why? Now, I think there are a number of reasons for this. <clears throat> the most obvious one is that there is a tremendous resonance with the doctrine of the imam. Yeah. Among Sam and the, imam. the perfect man, exactly, yeah. and the imam. And that goes for 12 Rishis as well as your Ismaili Shis as well. Mm-hmm. The Zaydis, of course, have a completely different, they don't have that notion of the imam, of, yeah. of, 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 of Isma and being in and all this. So I think that um, Ibn al-Arabi's doctrine of al-insan al-kamil is, is uh, functionally equivalent, yeah. I would argue, to that of the doctrine of the imam. And you see also a movement in this direction in falsafa. So, of course, the tradition of Avicenna is very important, Ibn Sina, yeah. also for the Shia world. And that's another question, why is that? But let's yeah. leave that aside. Yeah. But I think there's an extremely, extremely interesting passage at the very end <clears throat> of the encyclopedic work, Kitab al-Shifa. Hmm. Right, so the Shifa is this encyclopedic work. You've got logic, you've got uh, um, um, geometry, mm. arithmetic, music, you know, natural philosophy. That the whole thing, natural philosophy, yeah. psychology, the soul. Mm. Although that part never got published. The Dynamo is published. No, it didn't get published in the Cairo edition because Fazlur Rahman didn't like yeah. it there, and then he published it at, like the University of Durham or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yes, Oxford. So did that ever come out separately? It hasn't. What? Yeah. Okay. I need that. So that's that's a footnote. Um, I definitely have. It. I mean, it's <laughs> and there actually are two other editions of the. Okay, Dayana. we need to talk about that afterwards. Yeah. So then sure. you go all the way to the ilahiyat, the metaphysics. Yeah. So here we are. He's talking about wujud and mahiya and the usual stuff. You know, existence, quiddity, substance, accident, etc., etc., etc. The very last part is about. The philosopher King. Yeah. And the very last sentence, he says some very, he, he says, Yakadu and Yakuna, I think, Rabban uh, Insaniyan. I think that's what he says. I don't know. Something to that, that effect that, 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 that you know, he in effect becomes a human sort of God. Yeah. That, you know, that's a very strong statement. So that also 
is is I think in an imami vein, and I I don't accept the idea that uh, you know Ibn Sina was some sort of a Hanafi or something that uh, you know Gutas and the Gutasiya believe in. I mean, he was he was trained in Hanafi fiqh, but um, I but, was but trained said, in Hanafi fiqh. Yeah. You know, what does that prove? But um, I mean, certainly the um, so the yeah. account of the Prophet is is not kind of a a, a straightforward traditional Sunni consideration. It's and not. and the account of the ruler definitely sounds like the Imam. It definitely sounds like the Imam. And you have the same sort of stuff in Al Farabi in uh, Ara right. Al Madinat Al Fadila. Right. You have similar idea in Sufra Wardi. And of course all of this stuff and Ibn al Arabi sort of comes together where? Yeah. It comes together much later in Mullah Sadra. Mm-hmm. And I think again that that's a major reason for people like Allama Taba Taba'i and, and Khomeini and so because they were also part of this whole uh, transcendent wisdom or al hikmat al mutaaliya school. Yeah. Right? So I think that notion of the Imam, which is there in, in philosophy as well, and which is there in Ibn Arabi, and which is there in the Ishraqi, in al hikmat al Ishraq as well, about the Qayyim al Kitab, is uh, the one who, who upholds the book, as it were, okay. uh, in Shabdi Surah Wali al Maktul. So I think all of that comes together, but I think that the key figure here, and this will move nicely into our other topic, mm-hmm. if you like, but I am going to mention him at this sure. point. I really think that the Hamzat al-Wasl here, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the glottal stop that joins, so yeah. to speak, right? I mean, it works better in Arabic. You know, sort of the, the connection here, mm-hmm. in the link in the chain, so to speak, is none other than Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. Now, the reason I say this is because, again, it goes back to Sadr din Qunawi, because just like Fakhr din Iraqi is a very important link in the transmission of Akbari uh, doctrines in the wider Iran Zameen, the Persian you know, cultural sphere. Yeah. Now, Sivir din Atusi didn't meet him in person, but they had an absolutely crucial correspondence. Yes. Which there's two editions. There's the Khajavi edition, and then there's the one through the Orient Institute, the Helmut Ritter people, um, the, by Gu- was it Ged- Gedrun Sh- Schubert. Schubert? Yeah, Schubert. Yeah, not Kramer. Schubert. I hope I'm not mispronouncing. Uh, but anyway, it's something G Schubert. It's Gudrun Schubert. Gudrun Schubert, right? Yeah. So that's very important. Uh, Madlung wrote something about it, and that there was that. Uh, that uh, anthology on Tulsi that came called Donish de Tus by Nasrullah Pur Jawadi. Yeah. There's an article by Madlung in there. There's one by Landolt in there. Yeah. You know, Chidik never edited, but he talked about it in Had an one of his on papers it, yeah. back in the day. It's a very important correspondence. And the weird thing is that Nasir al-Din I don't know if this is just the kind of hyperbolic language which was, um, you know, very de rigueur in correspondence mm. of this sort, but he's he's referring to, you know, Sadruddin as the Imam, which I think is just really over the top. But obviously he really respects him. Now, whether that's just Ta'aruf or what, I, I really yeah. couldn't tell you. But the correspondence is quite interesting. And essentially, Sadruddin is sending him a treatise, which is called al risalat al-Mufsiha. Yeah. And then he accidentally appends something else there, and then he later apologizes to one of his students, you know, like... It's sort of like today when you're sending an email attachment, yeah. you attach something else by accident. <laughs> and so he apologizes for that part. But in Risalat al-Mufsiha, he's basically arguing that you can't really know haqa'iq al-ashya mm. through mere um, mm. uh, conceptual elaborations and 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 uh, rational demonstrations and so forth, yeah. that there must be a kashf, an unveiling. Yeah. So, you know, when we pray, Allahumma arina haqaiq al-ashya kama hiya, which is yeah. a constant refrain among I mean, philosophers and urafa, yeah. you know, oh Allah, show us the reality of things as they are. It's supposed to be a dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying you can't get there. And he's asking, among many other things, there's a bunch of questions, Nasir al-Din Tusi to sort of give his, his view, ibda al-ra'i, you know, to make yeah. known his opinion on this matter. And he even invokes the authority of, of Ibn Sina, saying, you know, Ibn Sina also said, you really can't, you yeah. know. But Ibn so, but Tautusi comes back and says, no, you, you've not really read this properly. And and what Ibn Sina really meant is that you can't really know the reality of things in terms of, of their definition and their tashakhus and their individuation. He didn't really mean you can't know intelligibles, ma'kulat. 
And so they sort of go back and forth on sort of minor points like this. But the whole point, it, it's very clear if you read the correspondence. And also this is argued by Madeleine and Landolt as well. Although Landolt wants to see a kind of Ismaili angle. Yeah. Um, that uh, Tulsi also recognizes that there is something beyond yeah. uh, Burhan. And that is also there, of course, in, in Ibn Sina in the, at the end of the mm. Isharat, the last part of the Isharat, and of course in the commentary of Nasir al-Din is on that, it also comes out. And of course they also talk about wujud. Yes. What does wujud mutlaq mean? What does wujud mutlaq mean? What does you know, absolute existence or the absolute being mean? And it's a fascinating correspondence, and I think maybe there's someone should do an English translation of something maybe we should work on. Yeah. Um, and actually it's foundational for the later debate between Sufis and philosophers. Because the whole debate about wujud mutlaq, which is kind of rehearsed again and again, you know, for all the way from the 14th century to the 17th century, is all based actually on principles which are laid out in that correspondence already. Absolutely right. So I think that was a kind of link or a turning point. It's a link in the chain and it's a turning mm -hmm. point. Um, because a lot of those ideas make it into the Tajrid al taqad yeah. And of course, the commentary, the Kashf al Murad by Al Alam al Hindi, this, this pivotal work of uh, uh, 12 Rishi theology by Nasir al Din al Tusi. Before we, we get on to yeah. Tusi and the Tajrid and all that. Sure. Um, sure. I mean, one, one, one last thing on the kind of the, the Shi re re reception of uh, Ibn Arabi. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's striking that. Out of all of the commentaries on the Fusus, mm -hmm. as far as I can remember, there's only really one which is she. And that's Sayyid Haider. Well, don't you count Kashani to be she? Yeah. I, I, Kashani, yes, but Kashani is not kind of explicitly that she in the commentary. So you're go stepping out of that because we've yeah. got we've got Sadruddin Qunawi, which isn't a line by line, it's a thematic commentary. Yeah. Then the real commentary is Al Jandi, then Kashani, yeah. then Qaisari, and that's sort of the Yeah. If but even, if, even if you go so later and look in Ankara, I mean, there's so many other commentaries. But, um, I mean, the only one from what I remember, which is very explicitly she, is, is Haider Right. Um, and yeah. I guess, I mean, they're all kind of like super commentaries. So, for example, you know, Ali Nuri's famous super commentary on Ibn Turkas, Sharif al is well, a very is she text. Isn't Ibn Turka she the Ibn Turka commentary, I think, is is more letterist than she. It's so letterist. Yeah. But the but the Hashia by Ali Nuri is letterist and she. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, it does. I mean, like there is a huge. Obviously, there's a huge yeah. reception, and there is the whole the obvious point that that the Qaisari text becomes like a, a seminary text which everyone studies. Now, when that happened exactly is it, that's an interesting question, but. But we certainly know that by the the mid mid Qajar period, at the very least, so roughly in the middle of the nineteenth century, um, the Sharif al of Qaisari was being studied in the seminary in Iran. Um, and at the same time, you have other texts which are being adopted, like the Tamhid al Qawaid of Ibn Turka and other texts. Yeah, that's an important book, yeah, you know, uh, which is seen as kind of like a fellow traveler. In a sense, that text is seen as it a, is it as is. a as a complementary one. And then, of course, you've got the Mesbal Ons as well, Mesbal which is also seen as kind of a... Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, no. why that is, but I just, as a, as a, an aside or a footnote, I would mm. like to say that letrism, I really don't use that term, but fine. Oh, Elm al-Hurl. Elm al-Hurl, but I would say Elm al Yeah. You know, so if you want to speak of letterism or general, mm. I think it is already Shi. I don't really think that there is a genuinely yeah. okay. Sunni... Uh, Letrism, or I really don't. I think it's. I think it's a she in its origin. I think. I think all you know the roots of esotericism mm -hmm. in Islam all go back to Imam Ali al Salam and the Ahl Bayt. Yeah, I think but that's, that's quite explicit. That's just a fact. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah, I think everyone would say that. I mean, the 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 other thing, of course, is that um, I mean, certainly in the modern period, the question mm -hmm. of Ibn Arabi and Tashayyo becomes a controversial one. It's very controversial. Yeah, but. But in some ways, the kind of the culmination of this tradition. I mean, there's there's lots of texts. Like you know, um, one which I was just looking at the other day, speaking to a friend Reza Shah Kazmi, was um, yeah, uh, Miftar Asrari Hosseini. 
So Miftar Asrari Husseini is this text by uh, 18th century uh, Nur Bakhshi Sufi, mm. who writes this text sitting in the Haram in Karbala, mm. of Haram of Imam Hussain mm. al-Islam. And um, the whole thing is heavily influenced by Ibn Arabi. Um, you know, it's the whole schematic nature of it. But of course, for him, in the direct sense, the Insan Kamil he's dealing with is Imam Hussain. Yeah. Um, so, and there are many, many other texts which have that reflection, even though they're not directly commenting on the Fusuls. But in some ways, the interesting kind of culmination of that process, especially within circles of what you might call Shi Sufi orders, mm -hmm. is Husayni Tehrani, right? In so, say Muhammad Hussain, Husayni Tehrani's Ruhe Mujarad, yeah, you know, this famous it's text, which was book. first published in the late 90s, in the early 90s, yeah, um, as you know, has about a hundred odd pages where he's trying to establish that Ibn Arabi himself was Shi. That's right. I have so read this word why, again, you are I right. Mean, it is about hundred pages. Why do we suddenly yeah. get to this bit where it's not just the reception, but it's like, no, actually he was Shi. That's why we should be gazing with this. Well, I've dealt with this at length in my uh, paper presented at that symposium, the first symposium of the Shi Institute back back in the day, and you and I edited that volume yeah. together, and it's called um, but it requires Imami by, a, by any a other more name would smell as sweet. Extensive article. All right, but I I would say that Muhyiddin Ibn Al Arabi was was not a Shi in the sense that he had some you know, secret room in his house in Syria where he had a tabut and an alam and a... I mean, that's, <laughs> right. that wouldn't have been part of the tradition. It wouldn't have been part of the part tradition. Of the so I, I, I am being a bit facetious yeah, yeah. when I say it, but I, he's not like some crypto she who's, you know, hiding in it. You know, I, I don't think so. No. I really don't. Um, at the same time, he has a number of opinions yeah. which are in line with, with Shi'i opinions. He thinks that Hayya ala khair al-amal is part of the Yadan. And this is the kind of stuff that these guys quote. Yeah. Who want to argue for the Shi'i affiliation of Ibn al-Harri. But, but there's an interesting uh, passage. And then you have the Khatm al-Awliya sort of. You have the Khatm al-Awliya problem. Yeah. And that I also dealt with in the paper. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know if I agree with that argument completely. Um, uh, in um, that, what's that work? Um, Al Fasl Shithi. Who's the author? I forget the name of the author now. Uh, Hassan Zadi Amuli. Yeah, no, he didn't write oh. it. Oh, you mean um, uh, Fasl Shithi? Um, Mazda Khom Shehi. Yes. Mazda Khom so Shehi. And the I, who was, of course, a famous tri uh, teacher of Qaisari. I, 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 I summarize his arguments in that paper. I'm not sure I'm convinced, but you can make the argument that he doesn't really, really claim to be that. Yeah. Um. But there's an interesting passage in Avicenna and the Visionary Recital by Korban, in which Korban tries to talk about the affiliation of Avicenna. Yeah. And he says something to the effect about how you can't really reduce a person to an index card. And, you know, I quote that in Imam made by other, any other name with Smell is Sweet. And then I say, well, if you just replace the name Avicenna with Ibn Arabi, I think it applies here. Yeah. He's an exceedingly complex individual. You can't really reduce him to a category of Sunni or Shi'i. He certainly doesn't fit completely in, uh, in either and I think it's for this reason that he resonates just across the Islamic world. Right. Um, and there are things which I don't agree with in Ibn Arabi. Um, uh, you know, so, but I think that overall his understanding of metaphysics is something which very much resonated. And again, you know, with a figure like Nasir al-Din a lot of those ideas through his, his, obviously his own philosophical research, mm -hmm. but his very crucial correspondence with Sadr al-Din mm -hmm. make it into the more than half of the, the Tajreed, I think. Uh, because, you know, the first and second parts are just metaphysics. Yeah. And you could, and, and my translation, I call it the abstracta theologica. Mm. Tajreed ul-a'taqad. But it's not really theology in the sense that you have kalam theology in the Sunni world. Mm. It's more, I mean, if we put it in modern terms, it's, a, it's natural theology. Right, he, he, we, without recourse to scripture and all this, it's just reasoning. Yeah. Um. And anyway, you said we, we, we yeah. When we get I mean, to, we'll get to Tusi when we yeah. get to him. But so I think that Ibn Al Arabi, yeah, is still very important uh, for the modern world. Uh, he, but he remains a controversial figure in the Sunni world. There's no, there's 
no age passes without many, many condemnations of the yeah. men, and that continues today. Yeah. But he's also condemned in Shia circles. There's famous, yeah. a very famous video of Ishaq Fayyaz, Ayatollah al-Uthma, Ishaq yeah. Fayyaz, you know, circulating in which he denounced Ibn Arabi and Sayyid al-Fusus. But that's almost sort of the default position of most of the marajah yeah. taqayyid. Mean, it's, it's like, right? the, you know, that so, famous text by Sayyid Jafar Muttal Amali where he, the book is called something like, yeah, Ibn Arabi um, Sunni Mutasib. Fine. So uh, that's actually the title of the book. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, it, it, but that that gives you a sense of what that polemic is like. Well, he, it's it's not just Ibn Arabi, it's also Mullah Sadra. They're all together yeah. because you know better than my, me mm. that the person that Mullah Sadra quotes the most in the Aswar yeah, is Ibn Arabi. And sometimes he just sort of lifts stuff entirely, doesn't he? Yeah. From Ibn Arabi. And, and I mean, that kind of. You know, the, the famous late 18th century version of that polemic is the, um, you know, the the back and forth between Sayyid al Ali and um, yep. uh, Sayyid Ali Akbar Shah Maududi. Yeah, you know? so Ali Akbar Shah Maududi. And, in, and, in and, they, and yeah. they trade the names. So they like say, you know, Maududi says, yes, but what about um, uh, Sayyid Haydar Amali? What about Kashani? Mm -hmm. What about Mullah Sadr? He says, you know, mm -hmm. names these names. And then, of course, with Sayyid al Ali, these guys are all like, you know, beyond the pale. Dildar so, Ali would change after he went to the Atabat. He sort of became becomes uh, socialized into uh, you know the sociology of knowledge here, socialized into the Usuli position, yeah. and then comes and says, you know, I because Maududi was leading the the prayers, yeah. he was leading yeah. the Jumma prayers. He was a very important figure, yeah. and so it becomes this whole yeah. power struggle then. Um, but that's another yeah. whole debate. Um, but you can't help but think that there is a dimension of that, if I may be so bold. Mm -hmm even today, because there is a contestation, isn't it? It's, it's about authority. Yeah. So if you acknowledge this, so if, if this is possible, hmm. if people have access to this profound spiritual knowledge, then what does that do for the Niyaba Amma, you know, and the, and the guardian, and if you're, if you're on the Walayat al faqih bandwagon, you know, uh, and if you are, that's fine. That's a whole other discussion. It's an opinion. Yeah. Right, it's an, it's, it's, it's an opinion that's been argued in, 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 in law. Right, so fine, if, and it goes with that as well. Although in that context, you know, maybe there's some uh, notion that you know the juris consult uh, or the wali yeah. faqih is some sort of philosopher king. But but the point is, there is a contestation for a kind of authority, isn't it? Yeah. So it, it comes down to well, is it going to be the person who is accomplished in the study of you know Rasail al Makasib and you know uh, the works of uh, Shaykh al Ansari and Akhund al Khurasani, Kifayat al Usul, and the whole Usul al Fiqh and al Fiqh complex, mm. or is it the Pirit Tariqat? Yeah, you know who claims that he he has he has direct access to this knowledge through through Kashf and Shuhud. Yeah, that's a major question, isn't yeah. it? And 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 it's very difficult for actually the the two to kind of coincide in the same individual. I think the and, only the famous individual who, who, at least I think it coincided in to some degree, to a great degree, would have been would have been. I mean, he could have pulled. Yeah. He kind of pulled it off, and you can yeah. agree or disagree, but he's sort yeah. of convincing, right? I mean, even even with some like Alama uh, Tawatabai, I think there you go. He he kind of holds back. Mm. So when you actually look at the so more Irfani aspects of his work, none of those are actually directly written by him. They're mm -hmm. kind of being reported from his classes. Mm -hmm. So it's, sometimes it's a bit more difficult to get a sense of how he was presenting himself uh, in the seminary. Um, but I yeah. mean, this, this, you know, this wider question of the legitimacy, so to speak, of Irfan, mm -hmm. um, the contestation of Irfan, often goes alongside the contestation of, of philosophy because by this point, philosophy is associated with Mullah Sadr. Yes. And so, in effect, you've got a convergence of Hikmat and Irfan anyway. You do. In yeah. terms of how it's received. But then, you know, coming back to Tusi, what about that? Because, um, yes, you can teach the Tajrid. I don't think anyone will necessarily object to people teaching the Tajrid or the Kashf al Murad in the, um, in the seminary. Yeah. But, is it really an important element of what's going on? Um, you know, there certainly is a very long tradition of Tajri commentary and um, marginalia and so forth. But does it really still exist in the same way? 
and and you know how can we how do we really kind of make sense of what the tajrid is today i mean i don't know my my understanding is to um recent seminarians yeah. whom i'm cross path with paths with that they actually you know they they leave out this whole part they don't do the they they don't do they the don't do al-maqsad al-awwal, yeah. right? And they don't do the second one. And they basically jump straight into al-maqsad thans fil jawa jawar al-arad. So they jump right into the third, hmm. which is fi ithbat al-slana wa sifat, right? So yeah. that's al-ilahiyat bil ma'na al-khas. So you know, they leave out the major part. And this is no. with the kashf al-murad. So that's m- most of the book, which is basically Avicenna in metaphysics. It's, it's and not... they jump into this and they love to look at the chapter but... on imama, which is very nicely yeah. done. So I I really wonder, and there have been a couple people who I've met hmm. who said, well, a lot of this stuff is irrelevant now, because, hmm. you know, he talks about the doctrine of the soul, for example, and so I think maybe some modern contemporary people are enamored of modern notions of psychology, but also he talks about the Ptolemaic model, yeah, uh, epicycles, if you know what those are, you know, if, if basically if you want to mathematically model the movements of the heavens as seen by a person on the earth. And so you assume that things go around the earth. Yeah. There's something called retrograde motion, mm-hmm. which is the apparent backward movement of a planet, which really you can only explain by the heliocentric system. Yeah. Because, um, you know, some of these planets are further away. And then when we move, it seems like they're going backward, but they're not because the orbits don't align. Yeah. Um, and so th- to come up with an explanation for this in a Ptolemaic model, you have to introduce another circular motion around a, just an empty point. Yeah. And that's known as the Ptolemaic epicycles. And there's the things called equants and deference. And Tulsi was an expert in all of this. Yeah. In fact, he's famous for something called the Tulsi couple. Yeah. Um, and the mathematics and the geometry is fascinating, but that's in here. And so people say, well, why do we need this? Why do we need the doctrine of, uh, of you know, substance and accident? And why do we need, uh, you know, there's the, the ancient doctrine of motion mm. is also there. And it, in Arabic, it's called al-harakatul qasriya, mm. which you could translate as forced motion. There isn't yeah. this, the, you know, this is, long, this is before Galileo yeah. and all of his uh, bid'as. <laughs> His innovations, yeah, and so there's there's a completely different understanding, and, and so I think in the minds of some people, they will think this is all this is completely unnecessary, and we should just e- eject this. But people who say this yeah. don't really have an education. Excuse me for being so, you know, and, and I don't mean to belittle these individuals, but they do not have a modern education in modern mathematics and modern physics and so forth, and they 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 are very impressed by the achievements of modern technology. Hmm airplanes and iPhones and, you know, all this kind of stuff that is around us. And so they somehow think that this is superior, but they don't, they, it's, the, the fact seems to be lost on them that even modern science is built on some sort of a metaphysics and metaphysical understanding. There's a tremendous change between, you know, what is before Galileo and then Galileo and then, of course, Newton and Descartes, they sort of, it's totally different. The notion of motion, the notion of mass, the notion of force, uh, these are, absolutely transformed with Newton. And I don't really think they, they get that. Hmm. And they think that the scientific method, al-manhaj al you know, the experimental method is sort of the be-all and the end-all of things, and it's not. And it's also, I mean, it it's fundamentally misunderstands the way in which metaphysics has has not disappeared, but has merely been transformed. And some of it Very is well merely said. like a sort of semantic shift. So, mm-hmm. you know, most people, I mean, there are a few exceptions, but most people don't talk about substances and accidents and essences and so forth, right? Well, I think In they the should. Set. Mm-hmm. But they talk about individuals and properties. And Precisely. there's no huge difference between substance and accidents and individuals and properties. Well, there's a very <laughs> important book in this regard by David Oderberg, who is a kind of Thomas, neo-Thomas, yeah. whatever you want to call him, called Real Essentialism. It was not an easy read, but it's a very interesting book. I think yeah. it's a very important book. Yeah. And, you know, when modern science dispenses with formal cause and final cause and leaves you with material cause and um, and um, efficient, efficient cause, 
So when you've gotten rid of al-illat uh, al-suriya and al-illat al-ghaiya, and you leave yourself al-illat al-madiya and al-illat al-fa'ili or al-fa'il, the agent. It's, that's physic- it's physicalism. It's physicalism, on yeah. one, but it's also, what is the justification? I mean, what is a physical law? What is a natural law? The, the claim that the scientific method is the only means to knowledge is not a sign is not a claim that can be justified through the scientific method these are metaphysical claims yeah. and so you can't get away it's from not metaphysics falsifiable as well you can't get away from metaphysics and if modern even modern science in this form if it yes. is to have any meaning what they are actually doing is looking at substance so these kind of facts if i may be, say so huh. are lost on a lot of these seminarians and and again why would they be acquainted with this they haven't so so i think they wrongly want to uh, shall we say throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to those chapters of the tajrid and think you know the only important stuff is the imama yeah. stuff and the you know ma'ad stuff presumably uh, and i guess part of it is also kind of this um sort of oblivion of the history. Because mm. if you look at the vast majority of the commentaries mm. on the Tajreed, um, not just the, the 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 two well the three famous commentaries, you know, the of course Hindi here, but then you've got the um the Isfahani and then later the Pushti, the, yeah. right? Most of the the actual bulk of the material is on the first two or three sections. Precisely. And a lot of the marginal commentaries are only on those. Um, so even, even like, you know, I think one of the best commentaries is actually, um, um, uh, you know, Jafar Asdarabadi in the 19th century, mm-hmm. the Al-Badahin Al-Badahin Asata. Right. Yeah. The and, one published by Bustan. In yeah. Five. There's like four or five. Yeah, I five, have that. Yes. That is very well done. So if you remember correctly, like mm-hmm. it's only a fifth of that, which is on yeah, yeah, you're Ma'ad. absolutely right. Most of it's on the other stuff. Yeah, because the and... other stuff is a lot easier. I think. <laughs> but it, but that's where that's where the debates were really happening. That's you where know, the debates were happening. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, there's no new debate on Imama. Uh, there's very little kind of uh, moving on issues around Ma'at or what prophecy is and what mm-hmm. the nature of mm-hmm. miracles is. I mean, there's 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 a really I, I one thing I've been fascinated always with the Tajrid. And I've never found this in the commentaries really a satisfactory thing to say mm-hmm. is when when Tusi talks about the arts and the sort of hidden knowledge or hidden sciences which the prophet teaches, mm-hmm. right? I've never come across a commentary which actually explains this very well. Mm-hmm. And even Hilly says something like, you know. What that really means is we wouldn't know how to write and we wouldn't know how to kind of do agriculture. You know, so simple kind of technique things. Mm-hmm. But it, it it must be more than that. Um, it can't just be like um, craft. It must be more than craft. Um, well, I mean, traditionally it was believed that these, these things go back to usually Idris, right? Yes. Or yeah. some I know. But it's ancient and But it's interesting prophet in the list yeah. of you know, the functions of the prophet, this is quite prominent. Yeah. And yet, no commentary really it does a very good job of explaining it. Well, I mean, there's room for your own, <laughs> own commentary now. No, but I, I mean, it's interesting because then, because it's about how you then, I mean, one of the things I think which is interesting about the Tajrid and texts like this is it's it's about a holistic approach. Right. So the, the metaphysics is a foundation for how you talk about prophecy, mm-hmm. how you talk about it, Mama, and then how you talk about Ma'ad as in sort of eschatological combination of this. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the functions of the prophet and their teaching and how you establish that and then how that continues with the imams has to be based on a certain metaphysics. Precisely. Um, and that's why... You know, you can't pick and choose. You can't just do this bit. No, you can't. Because there's a, there's a whole... It's, it's a bit like... I mean, to use a simpler example. Yeah. al bab al-Hadiyashar of Hilli. Yes. Which is a very short text. Mm-hmm. Again, people often just look at little bits, bits of it. But the text makes no sense unless you read the whole thing. Because it's only when you read the whole thing you understand what the metaphysical foundation is and what the the theme which unites the whole thing is and the theme which unites the whole thing is Lotf the concept of Lotf yeah because that's what ties together 
the divine justice with the need of, of prophecy, the need of imamah, and the need for why eschatology happens the way it does. Well, Lutf is a very difficult book, a uh, diff difficult word to translate. Yeah. How how do you render Lutf? What's your... I mean, the standard ones are like facilitating grace or grace. Or uh, I mean, the problem is the grace. The problem with has, grace is so Christian. It has, it has very heavy baggage associated mm -hmm. to it. But it's the idea of something which is um, a providential free gift from God. What would you think but, of the subtle distillation of mercy? Or, and, and Luth, or Luth. Well, Luth, of course, is directly associated with mercy. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, uh, and I mean, that would potentially bring us back to reality. It would. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the pivotal role of mercy yeah. has, you know, the most important, the most, well, the most important name in many ways. It is in our tradition as well. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um, but, and so, I mean, in a sense, this is, I mean, this is a different kind of conversation about how a seminary, how a seminary really should be, should be trained. It is, yeah. Um, but, but certainly the the idea that we do mm -hmm. need more holistic approaches mm. to these sorts of studies, and and if you read a text, you should read the whole text, um, which unfortunately is pretty much gone. And um, uh, you know, it's it's rare to find people who even stick through. So so even you know you think about. These big classes, um, you know, um, uh, Javad Yamuli teaching the Asfar, whatever, over, what was it, 10 years or something like that. Oh my Lord, yeah. um, how many people really stuck through it for the yeah, whole 10 yeah, years? Yeah, sure. You know, and how many people actually read the text through? Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, I hadn't thought about this when we were originally planning this, but. Yeah. The link between Ibn Arabi and, and Tusi is a really good one. It's a really, it's a very obvious it's a really one. important link. And I think it does come through the Tajreed. And I think that the Tajreed al Atiqad, with, you know, I think it's hands down the most important commentary, at least the one that everyone should begin with, is Kashful Murad by Al Allam al Khali. I really think that the Tajreed is the most important theological text in the history of Islam. And I am not being hyperbolic when I say this. Because if you actually look, even and when I say all of Islam, I mean this the uh, our our Sunni brethren as well, yeah, because, because it's a very important text in the in the commentary tradition. No, it changes the whole the whole uh, equation, or it changes the whole debate, or the whole game, or yeah. the whole situation. Because let let's go way back. Hmm. You've got the Ash'aris and you've got the Mu'tazaris. And Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari writes a very sort of rudimentary work called Al-Ibana an Usul al-Diyana, which is mm -hmm. basically just scriptural citations yeah. and a kind of scriptural theology deeply, deeply influenced by Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Mm. And then there's another text which, you know, some people claim it's not his and you know, like this more sort of didactic and Burhan-based Ashari Kalam, which comes later, you know, they, like I think it's Richard Frank had all these papers on yeah, yeah. the Luma. Uh, yeah. I think that's the work. It's been a while, and then you, you have the Mu'tazili and Usul al Sharh al Usul al Khamsa, and so forth. And then in Sunni world, you also had um, Abu Bakr al Baqillani. Yeah. He's, so he's he's before Al Ghazali's for something. Yeah, so he's he's the kind of and he, he has a tamheed. Yeah. And then you've got al Imam al Harmain al Juwaini al Ghazali's teacher. He has a book called um, Kitab al Irshad, not to be mm. confused with the Shia work of the same name on yeah. another topic. Um, but these are not works that are still studied today. No. They, they and you know actually in the Sunni world they have much later texts like in Al Azhar they read stuff like Joharat al Tawheed by yeah. Ibrahim al Laqani or something. Yeah. But the, the the really serious books in theology. Hmm. In the Sunni world, was really uh, Adl al Din al Iji's Kitab al Mawaqif. Hmm. And then you also uh, got its um, Tawali al Anwar, I think, fi Sharh al Matali al uh, Anwar, yeah. Qadi al Baydawi. Hmm. And these are very sort of closely related works, but if you actually look at the Mawaqif by Adl al Din al Iji, it's after Kashf al Murad, and the yeah. structure is very similar. They are responding to. Yeah. It's not only you have Sunni Sunni scholars like Al Isfahani in, in Tasdeed who, who writes. You know there are Sunni commentators on the mm. Tajreed, but there is a reaction to that, mm. and so they start writing Mawaqif. So really, if on the Shia side you've got the Tajreed with the Kashf al Murad, you've got Al Iji's Mawaqif with various 
you know, commentators and all sorts of other people emerge like the Jurjani and, you know, but the, what is the catalyst to that? What is the efficient yeah. cause? It's, it's the, the writing of yeah. the uh, and tajik. even even when so you... in that sense I say uh, sorry just to yeah. so, no, perfect that's why I say that it's the most important and influential um, theology or kalam text in the history of Islam. I think there's no doubt about. It. I mean, just by the sheer volume of the commentaries and the marginalia, huge. Um, it's. Um, I don't think we even have a full listing of how many there are. No, we don't. That's the those Islam guys. The the very nice volume which you brought yeah. for me from Istanbul. I was well, it's looking. It's nicely at, done, but it's not even. It's a huge list, yeah. but I think those guys have. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface. Yeah. There's so many works that remain in manuscript. There's works that are uncatalogued. There's stuff lying around in in India, in you know who knows in Central Asia, and collections all over the place, and even yeah. stuff in Istanbul which hasn't been cataloged. Yeah. And, and so, and even when you look at, you know, if you take the tradition all the way up to Abdul, you know, at the end of the 19th century. So, you know, of course, he famously wrote a commentary on the, uh, on the Nasafiya, right? And al Nasafiya. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, or was Nasafiya or the Adudiya? It's basically on, on Dawani on. I think it's the Adudiya, actually. I see. I now, didn't know this. Muhammad Abdul. Yeah. And, well, I mean, there's a bit of a question mark about whether he wrote or Afghani wrote it, you know, because... Astrabadi, Afghani, Afghani yeah. Astrabadi, yeah. So, Astrabadi, um, sorry, yeah. But, I mean, certainly those texts, and when you look at those lithographs, which mm. were published, mm. like, around the turn of the 20th century, um, I mean, they, th those sorts of debates make no sense unless you have the Tajrid and the commentary tradition on it. Yeah. Because, you know, those those texts are supposed to be creedal, right? Commentaries and creeds, but mm. they're not commentaries and creeds. They're full-blown theological, philosophical texts which come back to the sorts of issues which are raised here. That's what I find really strange about the Sunni Muslims today, that they seem blissfully unaware of all this. Like everyone has jumped on the Ibn Taymiyyah bandwagon and they've got like Allah, from a the Turks. Apart you know, from the Turks. So I mean, apart I, from think, the Turks, I yeah. think the Turks are very interested in, in reviving that tradition and yeah. also revising them, reviving the Maturidi tradition, which is of course their That's a whole other discussion, tradition. yeah. Um, what is perhaps a bit disappointing is that data. in yeah. South Asia that's not being done and in other parts of so so even like um, and then if you go further east if you look at Southeast Asia yeah. then their conception of Kalam theology goes a bit earlier so they're more just in the early Ashari yeah. stuff and not the later one so but anyway, South that's, Asia that's is a, just depressing yeah. on you I mean, I mean the it's, intellectual it's just kind fallen of so far when, when we go back to India Pakistan Lucknow it's so disappointing uh, and if you go to the Nadwat al Ulama library in yeah. Lucknow there's some amazing works there but nobody reads these things and it's just become so I mean especially since there's yeah. such a rich intellectual heritage and manuscript tradition in yeah, these places a huge, as well huge huge um, yeah. so I mean I Anyhow. guess yeah. almost a lost point um, please sure so these are all good reasons for saying, <laughs> yeah. first of all, we need a good edition and translation of the Fusus in one volume. Yeah, why don't you sponsor it and I'll oh, work no, on it. Yeah. So I can stop. And the second it. one is we also need a good edition and translation of the Tajrid in one volume. Well, I've got right? that. Okay. I've got the, the, the That's tajri. two things. Yeah. But also I think what is Not needed. Not published yet. What is needed is, is you know, in the vein of Cambridge Companions, we need companion volumes to these as well. So, you know, companion volume on the Fusus, which would which would be thematic, but would also be like, what about the reception here and in, in the Shia context and in the Ottoman context in South Asia? And the same thing with the Tajrid. What about, you know, what happens to the metaphysics of the Tajrid? Why, you know, what are the... The, the classic question about the creation of the cosmos in which there seem to be two positions, you know, in two different parts of the Tajreed. This whole question of Very what is point. the afterlife of the Tajreed. So, so this is what we need to do. We need to well, do these two all editions. Well, you the You approach we, Cambridge and okay. we'll do it. And we need to do like a Cambridge companion to the Fosos and Let's a Cambridge companion to the Tajreed. That's a, that's a fantastic idea. Bismillah Okay, we'll do With that. With the name of Allah, let us begin. Okay. That is so, great. Okay. Well, um, I think we should wrap it up there, but... Um, we could, of course, talk for much longer, but we um, could. Um, but thank you again. Uh, it was a Saidna. pleasure. I and, really uh, appreciate it. Uh, and I, I hope, uh, well, once we do those things, we can have a further conversation about why these are important and why people should go out and buy them. Inshallah. Yes, we will do that. <laughs>
Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank so, you. Thank you for for listening, and uh, hopefully you can join us at uh, in the next episode of uh, the Insight Interviews.